Welcome to Public Affairs Roundtable, a discussion of current events in the nation and around the world, and how they affect the people of Indiana. Here's your moderator, Larry Long. When serial killer Ted Bundy was executed last week by the state of Florida, he took with him a lot of answers, which means he left behind a lot of questions. Mr. Bundy, who killed maybe 50, maybe two or three times that many women, blamed it on hardcore pornography early in his career. He might have been, as his mother said always, uh, her precious little son, but in fact he led, be left behind uh, terror wherever he went. Today on Public Affairs Roundtable, we're going to talk about Ted Bundy, about uh, serial killers, about his, uh, his victims, about what it means for all of us. Our panelists are John Rouse, executive producer of Public Affairs Roundtable and a member of the political science faculty at Ball State. Angie Cooksey from the Department of Philosophy at Ball State. Eric Hickey, professor of criminology and criminal justice at Ball State. And Bob Hayes, professor of counseling psychology here at Ball State University. Uh, John, it's a frightening subject. Uh, we normally talk here about economics and politics. How does this fit in? Well, you're correct. Uh, crime doesn't have a high rate in terms of focus by the American public. However, it was a focus during the last uh, political campaign, the last presidential campaign. The issue of crime was very much up center. Uh, so the issue of liberalism and the liberalism that was put forth by the court, the Supreme Court in the early 1960s, there are three important Supreme Court decisions. In 1961, there was Mapp versus Ohio. It talked about something called the exclusionary rule. Very briefly, the exclusionary rule says that you cannot use illegal evidence in prosecuting people. In 1963, there was a case called Gideon versus Wainwright. The Gideon case said that any person had a right to a defense. And a third case, was passed, and that was the Miranda decision in 1966, and it's the best known decision that says that you have to advise people of their rights if they have been arrested. So those three decisions really kind of uh, beef up the liberalism of the early 1960s as was put forth by the Warren Supreme Court, which of course was a Republican Supreme Court. And so from a legal court point of view, Mr. Bundy or anyone else who has been accused of crimes has all these rights as has been established by those decisions. That's not bad. Uh, in fact, uh, our civil liberties are something we cherish in this country. Uh, the Willie Hortons and the Ted Bundys do have rights in this country, right? Well, they certainly do. Uh, I think the public is uh, angered to some degree because uh, the Ted Bundy case cost approximately nine million dollars. Uh, we are very concerned that uh, people uh, not abuse the system, and my feeling is that although Ted Bundy was a, certainly a, a mass murderer and serial killer, he was, he was within his rights to use the system that we have provided for him, and which he did to a great extent, and uh, I think that, that's what enraged the public so much. We're, we're all frightened by this, though. Uh, the Ted Bundys of this world, uh, the, the Willie Hortons aside, uh, used, whether for political purposes or not, that uh, this sort of thing does, does frighten us. It does say something about us, about our society. Uh, in this case, uh, the victims of Ted Bundy uh, were women. And that says something to women, doesn't it, Angie? Well, it certainly does. And not only does it speak to women, but I think that it speaks to all people. Uh, women just happen to have been focused upon this time, as you've pointed out. But uh, uh, t the Ted Bundys of the world threaten human rights. Uh, threaten all people. And so it is why as a society, before we take any action in regard to Bundy, wh whether it was convicting him or setting him free or whatever, uh, we wanted to be very clear and very sure that we had acted as responsibly as we could as a society. So uh, we had to put the emotionalism aside, uh, we as women and uh, all people, and say, yes, this man is uh, entitled to due process of the law, no matter how much that may cost, how much time that may take, uh, because in spite of our fright and in spite of our anger, uh, we must always remain responsible as citizens. Bob, uh, Ted Bundy blamed a hardcore pornography early in his life for uh, leading him to, to rape and kill women. Uh, that too is frightening, but uh, I guess we have to qualify uh, how much do you believe of a serial killer, of a, of a man who <laughs> thought this. Uh, does uh, his, his reason, his excuse ring true? 
I, I think it's interesting that uh, he made these statements in the last few days there. Uh, almost in the same sentence, he also said that he came from a very fundamental religious upbringing. Uh, I, I know I put myself out here on the line for all kinds of outrage if I dare to state that. But over and over it has been found that people who are uh, involved as sex criminals are the ones who have had the least exposure to pornography. Uh, more likely what they really lack is uh, any sex education. And so it's their development, but it isn't the exposure to pornography. Uh, pornography, uh, as I say, has been with us since, since the earliest times. And uh, I, I, I don't buy that as an excuse for Bundy. Eric, can we look at these, these people, these cases, and, and really tell why they do what they do? Well, I think that uh, uh, pornography is certainly not an excuse. And I don't think Bundy was uh, accurate in saying that was what caused him to do what he did. Uh, in all the serial killers that I've looked at, there seems to be, uh, for especially those who were involved with sexual type attacks, there seems to be this, this common thread of low self-esteem. Now, what that self-esteem, low self-esteem comes from uh, will depend upon their experiences in their lives. Uh, Ted Bundy, for example, was illegitimate, born out of uh, wedlock. Now, for most people, that's something they, they can be raised with and live with and not be a problem. And I'm not saying that was the, the, the causal factor for, for Bundy, but there was something in his life, uh, in his childhood, that affected him that he couldn't cope with. And then he later, maybe he got into his pornography. If he did, uh, that would certainly fuel fantasies. Uh, the alcohol could lower his inhibitions. But I believe there are certain factors, you know, many serial killers where their self-esteem is so low that they, uh, they have to have this desire to regain that, that kind of control in their lives, and so they kill others. Uh, I could give you one quick example. Uh, uh, a serial killer that I interviewed last month uh, had killed 10 people. And his last two victims, uh, as he explained it to me, he would get so depressed because he lost his job or he felt rejected because he'd failed a test. He was a college student at the time. He was doing very poorly. And, and each time he had that rejection, his girlfriend would say she'd want to be with him. And uh, that caused him so many problems in his own personal life that he felt worthless. And in order to regain that self-esteem for himself, he would go out and, and kill people. And... It was interesting, on his first victim, uh, first or second victim, he told me that uh, she died very quickly. And he was so angry because he wanted to gain total control of her so he could finally be in control of himself and have that control. Uh, he was so angry that he hung her up from the ceiling and beat her for 20 minutes with a stick and kicked her because she, 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 was, uh, she, she died so quickly. But then he went on to say that the second victim he killed that day died much more slowly. He later went on and killed children and he would go through a ritual. And he said it, it was the torture. It was the response they would give to me that made me feel in control of my life again. And once, they, once I finally was in total control, where I totally uh, degraded them and, and humiliated them through sexual attacks and through torture, then I would finally kill them. And he said, I felt so much better about myself. I know that's perverted thinking, but that's how many of these people uh, are, are respond to, the, to, to their uh, traumatizations. Do many of these people understand that well, Bob, why they do what they do? I mean, that seems to be like a man who, who, uh, who was plotting, who was planning, who was cunning, who understood. But I can't imagine that people uh, have that much of a conscious awareness of why they do what they do. I, I think, again, that after having some time to reflect and a person might go back and, and piece some of these things together. But I don't think that while it's happening that they're consciously aware. But they are aware that something is awry with them. Um, the risk that they take, uh, the danger they put themselves in, almost at times wanting someone to figure out what it is, but I don't think that they know that clearly what it is that's going on with them. You know, this issue is so overwhelming to me, I don't know quite where to go from from this point, but I think that last week we talked about abortion. This week we're talking about sex and crime and pornography. Our system is very capitalistic. We know in terms of crime that crime occurs among young people in terms of ages from 18 to 24. That's the predominant uh, area in terms of crime. For example, stay away from kids. And so also you have a focus upon lower economic crime, I would presume, too. But Eric, I presume the case with Ted Bundy is a little bit different in the sense that he was a middle class person. Yeah. And, and sure. why, why did Ted Bundy get so much publicity? I think for Ted Bundy, 
if you recall, that most of his victims were middle and upper middle class people. Had he killed minorities, I don't think he would have gotten the, uh, the attention, the national attention that he's received. Uh, he hit home. He hit, he hit us. He was one of us, and he killed his own kind. And that's what got his, his, uh, the great attention. Also, the fact that he was very bright and he was able to use the system. But I, I, I think that we have many serial murderers who murder lower class people. They do not get near the attention. Uh, we had a case uh, last year, uh, Donald Harvey in Cincinnati. Uh, he killed many people in, a, in hospitals. I think the final toll was around 58. We heard very little about him. But he killed powerless people. He killed older men in hospitals. He poisoned them. He suffocated them. But he wasn't killing young, vibrant people uh, for the most part. He wasn't, and he wasn't traveling across the United States. Uh, he was simply staying in one place, doing his job very quietly, and killing people that, well, they were going to die anyway someday. They were in hospitals. He was not a former law student who was killing two sorority sisters That's right. Florida That's University. right. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I don't mean to uh, belittle the victims who were killed by Donald Harvey at all. Uh, whether you're killed by Donald Harvey or Ted Bundy, either way, you're dead, and it doesn't really matter to the victim. But I think we need to understand that there are some dynamics here. Uh, if you look at the Wayne Williams case in Atlanta, Georgia, during the child murders, uh, you know, people have asked me, well, are there black serial killers? And historically, we find very, very few, if, if any. Uh, and it's only been the past 10 years that we've found several. And I think part of the reason is because there are cities that are becoming uh, they have more and more, uh, a greater black population, and therefore we're uh, giving more attention to black children who are being killed and, and black adults who are being killed. Where in the past, I think that we might have had a tendency, uh, I know this doesn't probably sit well with some, but I, have that, I think we have a tendency to kind of overlook those things and not really piece them together and not have the public pressure on us as we do when we have a white society and there are whites who are being killed. They are human rights, you talked about, Angie, but these still are in the Ted Bundy case, they're sex crimes. That's right, and I was going to um, interject and say that I think also part of the reason why this case had such notoriety was the link with sex, uh, the link with pornography, the link with obscenity. Uh, anytime the public hears those words, the ears perk up, uh, the interest is peaked, uh, there uh, is a virtual myriad of reasons why that occurs, but uh, let me just say that although these crimes are heinous and although they raise our, our awareness and, and they make us angry and they make us frightened. Uh, still, once again, I must caution the citizenry that uh, we cannot hang, as uh, Bob has intimated, all of Bundy's problems, uh, all of his motivation, inclination on pornography. Uh, let me also make, uh, make a a differentiation between pornography and obscenity. Uh, there's a real difference between those two words. The court, uh, Supreme Court, certainly recognizes that there's a difference between those words. And what makes the discussion even more touchy about those issues is that it, it tends to flirt with our notion of freedom of speech. In other words, we ask ourselves questions like, is the price we pay to control a Ted Bundy or Bundy's access to information uh, worth um, you know, sacrificing our freedom of speech, our freedom to, to say and read what we would or, or choose the, the art that we would choose or go to see the movies that we would choose to see. But just, if I can just make one comment on that, there are those, we, we've argued throughout history in the past few years that, that alcoholism may be, uh, we may have a predisposition for such a problem. And we're calling it a, a disease. Mm -hmm. uh, there are those who seem to be stimulated much more easily by pornography and who, who become tied into the hardcore, the violent pornography. Mm -hmm. I don't see that as an excuse for what they do, but I think that there, there are those who do have a tendency, maybe a predisposition for that kind of, that kind of material mm -hmm. uh, and, and seem attracted to it more. I think it fuels people's fantasies. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't make them do what they do, but it certainly is a catalyst that uh, it's like adding, fuel, adding gasoline to the fire. Yes. It certainly makes it more explosive. And perhaps in a way, the fact that the material is accessible may yes. in a, a kind of a subtly give nod that it's okay, give some kind of a yeah. license, uh, that it's all right to pursue these kinds of fantasies. And then of course, some minds will not only pursue the fantasy, but will try to then enact that fantasy in real life, which may have been the case uh, in some of the Bundy situations. I, I, I think uh, following up on what Eric was saying, the 
The one thing that all the studies where they've tried to measure the effects of pornography on people have shown that it is not pornography per se, but violence and yes. violent pornography or simply violence without pornography mm -hmm. that will stir up the uh, emotions and the activity in people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm glad you made the distinction between obscenity and pornography. Yes. Obscenity is the legal word. Mm -hmm. um, and. It's interesting that we always think of obscenity as being connected somehow to pornography or mm -hmm. sex. Uh, the actions of serial murders is certainly obscene. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the actions in war are certainly obscene. Yes. There are many obscene things, but we, we forget that because when we use the word obscenity in law, it seems to only go to this. Uh, as to the effect on people, I, in a month or so ago, uh, was a witness in the uh, trial in Anderson mm -hmm. on obscenity. And the thing that amused me was that the jury had to read all of the uh, materials that had been collected right. by the police in addition to some other materials that the defense wanted to read. Yes. I don't think that the members of the jury therefore went out and committed great crimes because they'd been exposed to this. Right. Yeah, I, I think on, you know, on one hand you have the political process and as I said, this issue does not have a high visibility with the public in terms of the political process. The political process does not handle this thing very in a very rational kind of manner. You know, as we looked at the campaign, we had the focus upon Willie Horton, we had the focus upon furloughs, but then after the campaign was over, George Bush said nothing more about it. But, but so, so you look at that political process where there's a great deal of emotion involved and, and uh, uh, a lack of rationality, but if you look at the legal process, and the word of the emphasis is process, it is a process in terms of procedures. And so we pay for certain kinds of procedures. As I've said before, democracy is not cost effective. In other words, in a sense, you'd mm -hmm. have to ask the question, why should we pay so much money to, pr to protect someone who has been accused of such obscene, pornographic crimes, how however you want to say it? So, so in our society, on one hand, we have the railing against this kind of protection, yet it is something that seems to be pretty strong set in our political system. Despite the First Amendment, free speech is not an absolute right. In fact, the courts have no. limited in terms of libel, in terms of fraudulent Absolutely. advertising, Absolutely. and in, in the field of obscenity as well. Mm -hmm. It would seem that even though Ted Bundy might be making excuses at the 11th hour, that in fact his statements will though indeed feed this irrational system, and that Jimmy Swaggart, who has now been burned again by Penthouse Magazine, in his war on Penthouse and on Playboy and on Hustler Magazine, that it's going to stir the emotions and, and bring people to Jimmy Swaggart's defense. I w would simply like to add to, to these comments that I think at every turn the American people genuinely attempt to act in a responsible and reasonable manner. It is why we don't rush into accusations and convictions. If we rush into an accusation, we certainly take our time in determining guilt or verifying innocence or the other way around. I might also add as well, in relation to the notion of the freedom of speech, my students are so tired of hearing this because I belabor the point. E equal rights uh, does not mean that all rights are equal. In other words, they all do not own the same amount of gravity. We all equally can own rights, but rights are generally graded or graduated in terms of their potency or their strength. Uh, as we look at the social situation in which the right is being exercised, uh, the whole notion of freedom of speech not being absolute is absolutely correct. Uh, I don't think even the drafters of that particular right ever intended that it be interpreted quite as literally as some factions of our society might like it to be. Uh, once again, in attempting to temper that right, I would hope the goal is that we're trying to act responsibly. As yeah, a yeah I, don't, I don't know that I agree because I'm not so sure that the masses would act in a responsible manner. The masses would go out perhaps and lynch someone but the elites in our society, Republicans, Democrats, the, economics, the economic elites, they agree on the system. I mean, they set the system. So I don't see any real empirical evidence. I don't know, perhaps I haven't seen it, but I don't know if the masses are responsible. I mean, the elites tend to put forth these systems that protect so-called criminals. That's why we have an electoral college, isn't exactly. it? Because we can't trust the masses to elect the <laughs> Now we have this uh, knee-jerk response. Uh, we see that Ted Bundy uh, and other serial killers, anything that's a, a, an act of sex, 
when you say, now, well, perhaps we can control that, control that behavior by uh, taking care of their, you know, doing some kind of operation on them or giving certain medicines that will take care of their sexual drive, which is a bandit response to the, mm-hmm. to the issue here because yes. I, I personally believe that, that uh, sex is only a vehicle mm-hmm. to destroy people, to dehumanize them. It's, mm-hmm. it's not the main reason they're doing it. They want to have control of those individuals. And so we're going to, as a society, respond to that behavior by saying, well, it's a sex crime, therefore we're going to uh, have it, we're going to develop sex offender programs. We're going to have institutional kinds of programs mm-hmm. where we're going to learn to control sexual behavior when really that is not the issue at all. And we often, uh, if we look at our mental hospitals and our mm-hmm. prisons, we have these kind of behavior modification programs which basically are totally useless in, in really changing that behavior mm-hmm. because that's not the driving force. Or we're going to establish a punitive law and castrate. Mm-hmm. Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. Yes. And there are those in our society that, that believe that is the best way to go to deal with the problem. It, it's like, let's blow up the Israelis' homes, I mean, the, the Palestinians' homes, and that will stop the violence. Mm-hmm. And we know that's not going to work. Mm-hmm. I want to create more violence. Mm-hmm. But, but, but the perception seems to be that there is a link between sex and pornography. I mean, even though, Bob, you say what you say, and I believe what you say, the perception in the public seems to perhaps I'm incorrect, seems to say that, yes, there is a link between sex, pornography, uh, and and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, pornography relates to sex. It relates Mm -hmm. to things that are erotic. It has its purpose of providing arousal. You go back to the word pornography. It was the writing of prostitutes, and they wrote materials to sell to men or to give to them to sexually arouse them. Uh, So there's no question about that. I think, though, going back to what you're saying, while go when we try to wipe out everything, uh, there are people who are, I think, what Larry said a few minutes ago, are really afraid today in our society, and they don't know how to come up with the answers. And so, the simplest answer is put them all in prison and keep them there and never let them out. We don't have enough prisons. We don't have enough space, and anyone who goes to prison most likely is going to come out mm-hmm. in time. Uh, that, that isn't the real answer there. I, I've seen the other side of it. I lived a few months in Spain when Franco was still alive. It was safe. <laughs> it was very safe, and I was scared to death. Uh, Back to the notion of uh, the link between sex and pornography, I want to concur uh, with Eric insofar as, as focusing on the, the element of control, because I think that's very true. Uh, I want to uh, note that sex may simply be a symptom of this illness. In other words, it's just maybe an accessible or a familiar avenue for that person searching for control, a familiar avenue for him to travel down to get that uh, immediate gratification, that immediate control. This is why I wanted to emphasize at the beginning of the program, this is an issue that deals in human rights because control knows no gender uh, lines. Right. Control That's is right. control. And, and what makes this issue even more dangerous, why control and the want or desire for that is more dangerous than the want or desire for sex is that that desire for control is quite old and ancient and can be seen not only in in human beings, but in the pecking orders established in, in all different breeds and, and kinds of animals and insects uh, on ad infinitum. So maybe we're dealing with something a lot more dangerous than simply uh, sexual arousal. If it is indeed the pursuit of control, uh, I certainly can see why some of the attempts to correct this behavior have failed. It looks like they're going after the wrong demon. Uh, I, th- I think so too. Mm-hmm. And of course, we always have the issue that uh, we immediately want to respond by saying, well, these people must be crazy to do what they've done. Mm-hmm. And my response is that the behavior is crazy, but, the, what, but they themselves are not crazy mm-hmm. or, or insane. They're mm-hmm. sane under law, the laws that we've established. They are judged to be, to be sane uh, by exactly what they're doing, of course, to the public, uh, to all of us, is, is an obscene, mm-hmm. insane behavior. But these people uh, know exactly what they're doing. They are, they're responding to urges and fantasies that they've developed in their lives. But uh, if, if is, there, is there a little bit of Ted Bundy in all of us? I think that's what worries us. Certainly not me. <laughs> I, 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 I really don't believe so. And again, I, I think one of the real difficulties in, in the whole thing is that people have always believed that. Mm-hmm. And so we have seen, first of all, the church. And then when the church and government were synonymous, and then when they split, both the church and the government have said, I'm all right, I I can control me, but I don't know about you, so we better have some laws, and and we better really restrict all this about sex and not talk about it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're we're seeing the other need today because of AIDS. 
of coming back saying, we'd better have some education. We'd better start talking about this very early and, and doing some sex education. Uh, a real turnaround. A few years ago, sex education was something the schools wanted nothing to do with. It, it seems, again, as we said last week, that uh, new questions need to be asked, uh, as if we're asking the wrong questions. You know, the issue of prisons is one thing that was not addressed in the political campaign. However, because prisons cost, cost money. more money, and the way you get more money for more prisons is to tax the public. And one of the big issues of the president was the fact that he said, no more taxes, read my lips. And so <laughs> yes. the, the issues of, of crime depend upon prosecutors and prisons and a criminal system, or justice system, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's, it's a justice system, not a criminal system. And so all that takes money. But it, in Indiana, we're saying pretty much we'll handle that. We're going to build more prison space. And we're going to develop the ultimate therapy, which is capital punishment. Mm -hmm. And we think that if we kill the Ted, the Ted Bundys, that that will take care of it, that we've killed the boogeyman, which, to put it simply, just does not ease mm -hmm. the problem. The problem mm -hmm. is still there. I think we feel really good about ourselves as a society that we've killed Ted Bundy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are just deluding ourselves. Mm -hmm. But uh, isn't there a certain uh, therapy in that, Bob? Is that it's the fact we feel better about it because Ted Bundy's oh, no longer with us? But it's so frightening because do you see what we've done? We've exercised the ultimate act of control. Right. Bundy himself yeah. would have loved it <laughs> and appreciated it. We've almost paid back his deed uh, with the, exactly the deed he but was But there are so many out there that, are, that will continue to do what he's done. Mm -hmm. uh, in spite of this. Yeah, we, we, we simply we can go back to our work and think, well, yes. he's gone. Mm -hmm. And he's not gone. Yeah. Bundy lives on. Well, he said that too, that killing yes. me is not going to solve the problem. correct in that. Mm -hmm. well, is, is this, I mean, are, are new questions going to be asked about these kinds of issues, or will we keep on rehashing the same thing we've been talking about for the last several minutes? Mm -hmm. hey, I think part of it goes back to the thing we were talking about earlier before we went on the air of, uh, now that uh, Bundy has been put to death, uh, this solves hundreds of cases. Every, every killing that was unsolved now, if they can tie it in with Bundy, uh, I, I don't think it ends anything. First it was 20, then 40, and then 50, and now that he's dead it was 100, and now it's 200, and next year it'll be 400, and it will go on and on and on. We'll clear all the books, and then we'll start fresh with the next serial killer. we got Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker from California, mm -hmm. just going on trial. They've already said it's going to take two to th two and a half years just to hear the testimonies, mm -hmm. uh, which they have a right to do, but we're going to start attacking, we're putting more... A quick on question there. for you, Eric. Crime, I mean... As a person living here in Muncie, I don't fear for crime. But, but is it, I mean, the question is, is it economic? Is it lower economic? Uh, quickly. How, quickly. Is it? Well, it's, it's certainly serial killing uh, has generally attacked the middle classes and lower middle classes, uh, but it, it crosses all lines. Truly, it does. Thank you. We're out of time. John Rouse, Angie Cooksey, Eric Hickey, and Bob Hayes for your commentary and comments here today. I'm Larry Law. Thank you for being with us.